to people here, which is really, which is really brilliant. Um, more people might join as you know in in, in the next couple of minutes. Um, and okay, so um, basically, this is uh, our first online seminar for the uh, the Reading Mark seminar. So the Reading Mark seminar was founded um, by myself, Solange, and Louis at the beginning of uh, this academic year. So in in sort of autumn 2019. Um, and we've held a number of events over the course of the academic year, including reading groups and seminars, which are all kind of exploring kind of aspects of Marxism, both historically and in the contemporary world. Um, so we've had reading groups focused on like key kind of texts by Marx, particularly from the early period. And then also we hosted Daniel Zamora in February, um, who was discussing kind of the relationship between Foucault and kind of leftist and Marxist currents in France in the 1970s. And we've got a few other things planned in the future. So um, if you're not on our main list at the moment, feel free to email. Uh, I think my email is on the Facebook event. So if you want to join the mailing list, uh, please feel free to email me and I can add you. Um, so we've got one, we, we plan to have an event uh, in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter protests, which are ongoing, particularly looking at the relationship between racism and capitalism. And we'll be announcing details for that soon. And we also have a conference next year uh, which is focused on the relationship between French and British Marxism from the Paris Commune till the present day. Um, now today, we're really excited to host Kat Moir, who will be talking about the great Marxist philosopher of utopia, Ernst Bloch. So Kat has recently authored a study called Ernst Bloch's Speculative Materialism, which is published part, as part of Historical Materialism book series and draws on untranslated texts by Bloch to uncover unappreciated aspects of his ontology, epistemology and politics and is a major contribution to the recovery of Bloch's philosophy in the 21st century. Um, so today, uh, she'll be talking about Bloch's idiosyncratic form of Marxism and asking whether it's really possible to kind of reconcile a sober economic analysis with kind of wild utopian dreaming and also probing the idea of the labor of the imagination. So uh, we're really excited to have Kat and we're also, she's joining us from Sydney, uh, Australia. So we're hoping to have people who we might not otherwise be able to host uh, during the kind of coronavirus outbreak. So this is certainly a, a case of that. Um, and Kat will be talking for a little while and about around an hour possibly, and then we'll have questions and answers. And we'll go through how we'll do the questions and answers at the time, but it will probably be best if people put their, either put the questions in the comments or indicate that they want to ask the question uh, in the comments because it tends to be a bit, a bit easier that way. And also if everyone could mute their microphones unless they're having to speak, just to reduce the background noise, that would also be good. Okay, cool. So I'll hand over to Kat now, who's going to be talking on Earth's Box Marxism. Um, yeah, thank you, Joe, um, for the invitation to uh, speak today to the seminar. It's really kind of you. Um, thanks, everybody, for being here, wherever here is. Like, I'm speaking to you from... Um, Bondi in Sydney, Australia, or to be more accurate, I'm speaking to you from the land of the Cadigal and Bidigal people of the Eora Nation, um, the, you know, the traditional custodians and um, owners of this land. When the British invaded this coastline in 1788, the land and sovereignty of, of the land were never ceded. Um, and for those of you who maybe don't, you know, have not visited Australia, that's kind of a customary way to begin uh, events like this. But I think at the moment with all of the important political work that's happening here and around the world in the name of the dignity of black lives, it's necessary to um, acknowledge that, that history. Um, so yeah, thanks for inviting me to talk about Bloch and uh, particularly that my you know my book that you uh, kindly mentioned um given that i'm talking to the cambridge reading Marx seminar i sort of wanted to um try and you know think about what what kind of marxism i suppose ernst bloch uh, really espouses or offers us um detlef pastor has this really nice little thought in his small introduction to blocks philosophy where he says, you know, one of the things that unites a lot of otherwise rather disunited Marxists is the idea that, you know, Bloch doesn't really have anything to do with Marx, or at least not with the kind of sober, serious version of Marx that 
is going to get us out of the shit or something like that. Um, and indeed, for anyone who's read that little text on um, the, the compilation of, of lost writings on Marx that I circulated, or that I think Joe circulated, you'll see that indeed, Bloch's Marx is the early Marx, it's not the Marx of capital. Um, and, you know, this has, has provoked some kind of, uh, some, some um, responses uh, in relation to, to his philosophy and questions that hopefully we'll be able to talk about today. So, you know, what kind of Marxist was Bloch or what kind of relation do, to Marx did his thinking have? And in the rest of my talk, I'm going to try and answer this question by way of giving you an overview, really, of my book and the arguments that I make there, which, as Joe just said, is called Ernst Bloch, Speculative Materialism, Ontology, Epistemology, um, Politics. So as the title suggests, I read Bloch as a speculative materialist. Um, and as I hope will become clear over the course of the next, you know, uh, well, I'll stop talking when you tell me to stop talking, but the next, you know, best part of an hour. Uh, speculative materialists is really just another way for saying utopian Marxist, which for some people might seem to be something of an oxymoron, given the kind of ambivalent relationship um, that Marx and Marxism has with the utopian tradition. And we could, you know, go into that a little bit more, um, but I assume that, that uh, that um, this group understands um, the, the ambivalence that I'm talking about. Um, certainly, you know, this <clears throat> utopianism and Marxism, uh, this combination has made many people kind of love or hate Bloch. He's a bit of a kind of Marmite thinker, um, as people say where I come from. But it's my job to convince you that, you know, speculative materialism slash utopian Marxism is at least some kind of possible and possibly even useful uh, theoretical position to maintain. So I'm going to share my screen now because I've got some slides and I'm not very adept at this kind of stuff actually. So um, I'm kind of reading from another machine and doing the slides on this one so just like bear with me if I... Uh, oh, can I, can I um, share it? Because it says here it's supposed to disabled attendee screen sharing. Someone check maybe. Yeah, I'm just I'm just checking that. Sorry. Um, um, let me just see if I can. Okay, I think I've made you a co-host now, so it should be possible for you to uh, for you to share the screen. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. So, um, for those of you who you know uh, might want this, there's a very brief sort of Lebenslauf of Bloch, which I won't go into um, deeply, except to say that it's important for us, I suppose, that Bloch um, spent so much of his life in exile, including between the communist and capitalist worlds, as was, or as were, because, you know, he was one of the crucial facts about his reception and his, um, uh, well, his intellectual relations during his life were that he was never quite Marxist enough for the kind of more orthodox crowd and often too considered too dogmatic or too communist, as Horkheimer put it, when he didn't want to give him a job at the Institute for Social Research in exile for even his heterodox um, peers. So this experience of perpetual exile was both intellectual as well as kind of biographical and political as it obviously was for so many people during the 20th century. So the main period of Bloch's um, life and intellectual production that I'll be talking about today <coughs> is the 1930s when he was in exile from fascism, first in Paris, then in Prague, and then in the USA, which is where he wrote the book for which he's probably best known, um, Das Prinzip Hoffnung, The Principle of Hope, which on the surface at least is probably best described as a kind of phenomenology of utopian consciousness. So it's Bloch's attempt to kind of catalogue 
um, the diverse manifestations of utopian longing and anticipatory consciousness, which he finds really everywhere in religious images, technology and medicine, everyday life, you know, um, art, culture, and all of those places, and which he argues orient collective aspirations for social change as they are passed down from one generation to the next in various forms, in the form of what he calls a cultural surplus. So already while when Bloch was studying with Georg Zimmel, um, he came up with this idea of um, the, the not yet conscious, mm -hmm. which he calls his, um, well, uh, which I will call his original insight, <coughs> or to Henry's phrase, but he himself also says, you know, this is the idea that sort of um, founded his philosophy. And the concept of the not yet conscious which is what is, you know, um, theorized extensively in Das Prinzip Hoffnung, um, it refers to an, ac an aspect of consciousness that relates to um, what is at a given point in history only possible or perhaps coming into actuality, coming into being in material reality. Um, and as I say, the, the, the principle of hope is really about this phenomenon. And obviously, in the way I've just phrased it, there's obviously more than merely a phenomenological claim underlying this idea. And in the principle of hope, we find elements of Bloch's materialist ontology, um, the definitive slogan of which could be, and this is a quote from the principle of hope, the world process itself is a utopian function and the matter of objective possibility is its substance. So I'm gonna say much more about this idea as we go, but the key point is that in the Principle of Hope, Bloch asserts, which by the way is published in 1959, um, well, it's published in, uh, I'll come back to that in a moment, but um, in this book, Bloch asserts a theory of matter um, as a kind of self-realizing, self-limiting, unconscious agent yeah so driven to kind of realize itself by a, a desirous lack at its core that's nevertheless preserved as a kind of lack in the process of its self-realization so this is a pretty bold ontological claim um but from Bloch's point of view in as Prince of Hoffnung, you know this kind of theory of matter is necessary if we want to explain the existence of things like the human imagination without referring to um, or resorting perhaps rather to things like philosophical dualism or even a kind of supernaturalism. Uh, in other words, while remaining good, consistent materialists. So Loch um, wrote The Principle of Hope during the same <coughs> period of his life and same production cycle um, as he wrote the book that I'm going to talk about today. Um, he wrote The Principle of Hope during the 11 years, more precisely, when he was in the US, living in the USA, and it was published, um, as I started saying before, in three volumes, first in East Germany in 1954, 55, and 59, with Aufbau Verlag, um, and Bloch, when he returned to Europe from um, the United States, it was to take up a, a professorship at the University of Leipzig, so in East Germany. Um, and the first and the West German edition came out in uh, 1959 with Zorkamp. And when it was published, you know, this book um, robbed a lot of people on both sides of the Iron Curtain up the wrong way for a range of reasons. So, so I, I'm just realizing now that I haven't translated these two quotes, and I'm sorry about that. I think all the others are in English. So, um, so. In East Germany, critics like Manfred Boer, who was at one point Bloch's assistant, um, you know, argued that the thinking on display in The Principle of Hope was kind of anachronistic because it went back to a kind of philosophy that was supposed to have been definitively overcome by Marxism. You know, it draws on German idealism, romantic thought, and so on. And so it was um, not, not not valued by uh, people like Boer. In the West, you know, you get people like Ludwig Marcuse who wrote, and there were a bunch of really, um, really kind of sharp cr uh, criticisms in um, critiques of the book in the Stuttgart Zeitung, and Marcuse's was, uh, is the best known, I guess. Um, and, you know, Marcuse's argument or objection was that 
the principle of hope was essentially he saw it as a kind of justification for Soviet projects, the hysterical, this you know historical narrative of utopia that Bloch is tracing. Um, he argues is supposed to culminate in some kind of world to communism, and 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 Marcuse and many in uh, in the Western sphere didn't appreciate that. The most famous, though, and most influential criticism of uh, the principle of hope was written by Jürgen Habermas, and it appeared in 1960 under the title "An Marxistische Schelling zu Ernst Bloch's Spekulativen Materialismus." Um, had a different title in English, but the German one is better. It, a Marxist shelling on Ernst Bloch's speculative materialism. Um, and, you know, here Habermas's use of the term speculative is obviously supposed to be pejorative, right? So Kant had famously outlawed speculation as the, um, you know, the rasen der Vernunft, the illegitimate application of pure reason um, beyond the bounds of mm. experience. And Marx and Engels as well um, rejected speculative thinking as, you know, mystical, religious, and permissible. Um, so Habermas's, you know, coinage of this, this term, speculative materialism, in relation to Bloch is supposed to be um, critical and pejorative. Um, and the reason that he uses it is because he's paid attention to the bits in The Principle of Hope where Bloch gets all ontological um, and the real or imagined consequences of this. And he makes four um, main criticisms of Bloch's project in, in his review. So first, he argues that Bloch's ontology is a kind of politicized, romantic nature philosophy that is, and this is important, not a return from Marx to Hegel, as some might assume, but rather from Marx to Schelling, on whom Habermas, of course, you know, got dissertated. Um, so <coughs> he, he makes that claim. So that's the, the ontological claim. Second, he claims that Bloch's epistemology was um, pre-Kantian, pre-critical, you know, he, he just goes back to the kind of naive realism that indulged in um, the kind of reflection theory of knowledge that Soviet Marxists were, uh, Lenin, chief among them, um, accused of. Third, Habermas, like Marcuse, claimed that politically, Bloch's utopianism was effectively an apology for total totalitarianism, yeah, in which the kind of achievement of a deliberately predefined end um, justified any means, including those of violence and oppression. And finally, fourth claim that Habermas makes in this review, he says that Bloch's literary style, so Bloch is a, a, an eminently literary writer, <laughs> yeah, his philosophy is um, stylistically very distinctive, um, Habermas argues that Bloch's literary style was kind of, and by extension his style of thinking overall, was obsolete and outdated. Yeah? And if you're thinking, maybe you are, maybe you're not, this critique of obsolescence echoes that of Manfred Buhr, who says Bloch's kind of regressing to something, well, Habermas himself, although he doesn't necessarily share Buhr's um, ideological position makes the same point at, at another point he says Bloch had regressed to a kind of philosophy and Marx was definitively supposed to have surpassed so these four claims um, that Habermas makes are important for me now Habermas's review of the principle of hope and Bloch's ontological project in particular initiated a thread of quite persistent and influential interpretation, both in the Anglo sphere and the kind of Germanophone sphere. So here are a few, this is a, you know, a, a grab bag of these kinds of things. So Alfred Schmidt calls Bloch a speculative materialist in the same kind of pejorative vein as um, Habermas, Kolokowski and Jay have both argued that Bloch's kind of cosmological ambitions are completely inc inconsistent with the project of historical materialism. Um, or consistent to some degree, at least. Um, Fred Jameson has argued that Habermas, um, like Habermas rather, that lost Marxism isn't actually all that Hegelian, in fact, but has um, other elements to it. And when David Kaufman writes that there is too much Schelling and too much Stalin in Das Prinz of Hoffnung, you know, he's kind of rehearsing this 
um, claim that in some sense Bloch's political philosophy is totalitarian. Right. So here's the, let's call it the Habermasian critique um, of Bloch's ontology. Now, the problem with this, as I see it, um, is that, you know, well, it's based on the, the sort of rather subterranean kinds of claims that Bloch makes about ontology in The Principle of Hope, which was um, published, as was Habermas's review, 10 years before the book in which Bloch actually elaborates his uh, ontology. Um, which is this book, Das Materialismus Problem, Seine Geschichte und Substanz, The Materialism Problem, It's History and Substance. Um, it hasn't been translated into English yet, there's a big chunk of it that I did in the back of my book as an appendix, which is possibly helpful if you want to get a sense of it. Now, as I said before, a lot of this book was drafted during the same production cycle as the uh, as Prince of Hoffnung, so um, in the years preceding Bloch's Sojourn in America, though, where, when he was still in Prague, but it was only published in a revised and expanded form in 1972, by which time Bloch was living in West Germany, having escaped the East as a result of persecution by a regime, which I will return to. Now, in this book, I mean, this is just a kind of interesting anecdotal thing in a way, like Bloch calls himself a speculative materialist for the first time. You know, he so, uh, makes that, labels his own philosophy that. And I've looked through a lot of the, well, I've looked through the manuscript material for the book and a lot of the other stuff that Bloch was writing around this time was published in this big volume by Gerardo Cunico called Logos de Materia. And like, obviously he uses the words speculative and materialist in various ways, but he doesn't use that collocation as far as I can find it anyway so i kind of am partly convinced without being able to kind of philologically really pin it down that he is reappropriating that term that habermas labels him with um, in the critical review um but in any case in this book bloch develops the the, the theory that is <clears throat> there kind of in um in a nutshell in the principle of hope. So he develops a concept of matter as the self-realizing impersonal agent of nature and argues that the possibility of a utopian society, and indeed perhaps, well, not perhaps, something rather more than that, um, resides in matter itself. Yeah? And, and he argues that human beings as a form of matter become conscious are capable of helping to realize this, um, uh, this possibility. So based on a critical reading of this book in its historical context, um, I argue that the Habermasian line of block interpretation uh, needs to be revised in the following ways. So I think that an, an analysis of this book enables us to, let's say, nuance and in some, in some ways correct some of the block myths and legends that follow from Habermas's <clears throat> analysis. So on ontology, I argue that it, it blocks speculative materialism is in at least as much of a Hegelian inheritance as a Schillingian one. Um, I think it works productively with historical materialism rather than you know simply breaking with it. Um, a, num a couple of other criticisms that have been made of this, and hopefully we'll have time to talk about them, is that you know Bloch's ontology is sort of a, a it's got a simplistic teleology embedded in it. It's anthropomorphic <coughs> in a pragmatic way. I think those things can be relativized a little, should be perhaps. Um, in relation to epistemology, I think I, I argue that Bloch's speculative materialism was significantly influenced by Kant and neo Kantianism, um, and that his epistemology actually sort of charts uh, a canny path between Kantian criticism and Hegelian conceptual realism. I argue also that Bloch's expressionist, uh, expressionistic style does it is not obsolete, but in fact does substantial epistemological work for him, right? Um, by signaling his insight into the at least the present incompleteness of our knowledge, which once again um, puts him more in the Kantian camp than I think Habermas would be willing to concede. Um, and politically, 
Uh, I argue that Bloch's, you know, failure <clears throat> to condemn Stalinism in the 1930s, and he did fail to, to do that. He, um, in fact, um, you know, uh, well, I'll, I'll say more about that when we get there, but he, he certainly um, didn't come out against the purges and so on. This is significant, of course, in terms of Bloch's personal politics, but I don't think that his philosophy as a whole can be simply identified with these views for a range of reasons and therefore dismissed as a kind of apologetics. Um, and indeed, a closer analysis of just materialism's problem reveals a quite complicated, well, complex, barbed critique of orthodox Marxism and Leninism as well. Okay. On the relevance point, and I'm not going to talk about this today because I won't have time, but maybe we can talk about it in the questions. Um, so <clears throat> the main part of the book is a kind of historical reconstruction of what Bloch's speculative materialism is, you know, in, in dialogue with this uh, vision that <clears throat> Habermas and others have offered. Um, I, I do, in, in the final section, sort of um, make a case for the relevance of the position that Bloch puts forward in relation to various debates in contemporary materialist um, thinking, particularly around the questions of agency, by bringing Bloch into dialogue with people, like, well, <clears throat> with, in particular, Quentin Miasso, Jane Bennett, and the ecological Marxisms of um, John Bellamy Foster and Jason Moore. Um, so this is a kind of second strand alongside the, you know, style qua epistemology thing, of the rebuttal of the irrelevance claim, but as I say, for reasons of time, I'm not gonna go into that too much. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so what I'll do in the rest of the paper is just kind of run through uh, the argument of the book and the ways in which I, um, as I say, relativize, or in some cases want to but push back against some of these uh, claims that are made against Bloch's speculative materialism. Before I do that, though, I'm just going to outline, well, I say briefly, not so briefly, what <coughs> outline the materialism <coughs> problem that is the, the, you know, is in the title of this book, because it also sets the contextual scene for what Bloch was doing and why he was doing it. So. Um, the problem with which Bloch is dealing in this book is actually um, what the philosopher David Chalmers has called the hard problem of consciousness. So it's this question of how, if we want to have a cons you know an ontologically consistent materialist perspective, can we explain the emergence, or how can we explain how consciousness arises out of or amid supposedly unconscious matter? And as we'll see, Bloch's book intervenes in the kind of latest instantiation, if you like, in the context of um, the metaphysics of the second and third internationals of a kind of long-standing debate between mechanistic and vitalistic approaches to answering this question. And that's a debate that's been kind of artificially polarized at points perhaps, but given that it was deeply polarized in the context in which Bloch was writing, um, I'm gonna present it that way rather than problem problematizing that. Um, and I'm also going to pick it up in the mid 19th century, which is not where it starts, but uh, with the so-called materialism debate, because that's where the relationship between politics, science, and philosophy gets really knotty. Okay, so um, the mechanical materialists, as they have been called by, you know, um, well, <laughs> Marx and Engels, uh, uh, Frederick Gregory has written an, an excellent book on on these figures, um, were a group of physiologists, many of you will have come across these uh, figures before, but they were a group of physiologists working in mid-19th century Germany who were also political liberals and supporters of, or in some cases, for a, specifically Karl Vogt, who was a parliamentarian in the Frankfurt Parliament, um, supporters of or participants in the 1848 revolutions there. And um, the, the, the question of consciousness um, in the perspective of a materialist worldview comes into play for these characters because they were <clears throat> experimental mm. scientists who were conducting um, experiments, for example, with pigeons, Fogged, 
um, reports in his physiological letters on experiments that he conducted with pigeons where he observed that the mental functions of the pigeons diminished as he sort of cut parts of their brain away. <coughs> um, which is, you know, from today's perspective, perhaps seems a little unethical. But um, based on this kind of data, these figures, and there were differences between them, but broadly concluded that, you know, um, reality was reducible, if you like, to um, matter, to the material. And things like free will and consciousness were illusory, epiphenomenal kind of um, uh, things. And Forged, you know, famously, and he gets this from Cabernet actually, but uh, the, the, the key quote that is sort of uh, associated with this position is Forged's citation of Cabernet, where he says, thoughts stand in the same relation to the brain as bile to the liver and urine to the kidneys, yeah? So <coughs> thought is a kind of um, intellectual excrement in a, in, a, in a sense, which is obviously uh, kind of, kind of um, interesting. So this was a really highly controversial idea at the time, as one can imagine, it flew in the face of um, ideas, you know, religious ideas about uh, the origin of consciousness and um, free will as sort of um, divinely divinely bestowed and so on. And it's, you know, it's in many ways, this kind of thinking still is rather, um, rather controversial. <clears throat> and unsurprisingly, criticisms were made of it on a number of fronts, and I'm going to just talk about a couple. So neo-Kantians like Otto Liebmann and Friedrich Albert Langer, who wrote a big critical history of materialism, argued that the mechanical materialists had overlooked, forgotten about Kant's insights into the limits of knowledge, right? <clears throat> they claimed that when, um, so the, the neo-Kantians claimed that when the mater mechanical materialists were talking about matter, they really didn't know what they were talking about because they were just um, conf they were kind of confusing a concept with the thing in itself, just because they were doing empirical science. Um, and, sorry, this is where I have to switch to something else. Yeah. Okay. And um, the Marxist critique, you know, was not entirely out of step with this. So um, Marx and Engels were not anti-Kantian in this respect. They saw mechanical materialism as what they called a vulgar, because simplistic, because reductive position. Um, not only consciousness in, you know, after the Kantian uh, or cognition, after the sort of Kantian um, turn, but also labor, they argued, um, mm. produces material reality, however, as well as being part of that material reality itself. So there, you know, their thinking on um, the constitutive role of human labor was very much in, in uh, following the kind of Kantian um, vein. I'm just going to skip through to um, Engels. And so Engels, in the Dialectics of Nature, when he talks about the concept of matter um, as a pure creation of thought and an abstraction, you know, he's, it's the mechanical materialists, among other people, who, whom he sort of uh, has in his sights here. Um, this idea that, you know, um, matter is merely a concept uh, and that concepts aren't, don't have any kind of material reality. They, they are speculative inherently. And I'm going to talk more about this um, in, in a little while. Um, so the Neo-Kantians and the Marxists kind of had some, had some similar things to say. Marx and Engels were rather, also rather um, uh, didn't have always great things to say about the Neo-Kantians, but they did agree on uh, a number of things. And one of the things that they agreed about was also the existence of a mind independent reality at some um, level. It didn't fundamentally challenge that. So, for example, when Friedrich Lange in the History of Materialism writes, um, you know, about 
Hermann von Helmholtz, who I haven't gone into, but about um, about his thinking, you know, he leads us to the very limits of our knowledge. He nonetheless betrays to us at least so much of the sphere beyond it as to convince us to convince us of his existence. You know, he is indicating that he uh, believes in the existence at least of some kind of mind independent um, reality, and um, it's very clear from uh, the German ideology, but also other places that Marx and Engels. Um, <sighs> had the same view. Um, with the development, with the later development of positivism, um, in the thought of Ernst Mach, among others, this position appeared to be really kind of more robustly challenged. So the idea that there was such a thing as external reality appeared to be more robustly um, challenged. And uh, you know, Mach was not, I mean, Mach was actually a monist in the sense that he didn't believe that there was anything kind of outside of the natural world. Um, but he, he did argue that nature in itself was impossible to know precisely because he claimed it didn't exist in any sort of straightforward or simplistic way. His was a monistic, but a, a relational ontology. So in the place of, let's say, bodies, um, he spoke of complexes of sensations, right? Um, I mean, just to kind of give a sense of the monistic ambitions of his project, you know, he argues in the analysis of sensations that there can be no distinction between the psychic and the material. So he says, he talks about the principle of the complete parallelism of the psychical and the physical, which is even very cynicist. Um, he says there's no opposition between these things, but simply identity, right? So, so he's a monistic thinker, but then you get things like this, what we represent to ourselves behind the appearances exists only in our understanding and it has the value of an arbitrary and irrelevant formula, which obviously, read a certain way, gives the impression um, perhaps of um, solipsism or something going more in that direction. Um, but um, Alexander Bogdanov and a number of other, uh, you know, Russian Marxists in the early 20th century um, were very interested in Mach's philosophy, partly because, and Bogdanov himself, you know, his own thinking was also monistic, as the title of the book um, Empirium Monism makes clear. So they were interested in this, partly because it was an anti-mechanistic monism, really, um, that Mach was, was um, offering there, and offered a kind of theory of knowledge as well that had space for a certain amount of perspectivalism. So in Imperial Monism, um, Bogdanov develops this idea of the labor point of view, as he puts it, so almost a kind of um, standpoint epistemology that is uh, after that. Okay. So, I'm just wondering if someone has got their um, mic on. Yeah, could, could everyone turn their mics off? Please. Great. Okay. Sorry about that. No worries. Um, so Bogdanov and a no, um, um, number of others were attempting to combine the insights of Mach um, and um, other positivists with those of Marx in a kind of philosophy that sought to be materialist while at the same time you know, critical of our ability to um, have transparent access to a mind-independent reality. Um, and this book, this work, um, Imperial Monism, came in for criticism um, by uh, Lenin, Vladimir Lenin, who was one of Bogdanov's apparent political opponents, at a time, you know, in the period of sort of the Bolshevization of Soviet philosophy when philosophical correctness, if we can put it like that, was becoming a kind of ideological weapon in Soviet Union and in the Second International, Socialist International more generally. Um, and so Lenin's position was that Machism was a, an idealist philosophy that sort of went against the principle of the primacy of matter uh, over mind, which was a step, you know, which he argued was established firmly by Marx and Engels and wasn't really up for negotiation. Um, and underpinning the Leninist position in this book, at least, was the sort of famed reflection theory of knowledge. So he counters 
Max, Max, um, sorry, the Russian Mahists, as he calls them, you know, Bogdanov and crew, um, with the, the idea that, um, you know, we have, we, we do have, in fact, a uh, rather perfect um, capacity to know the real, um, as the, the quote here indicates. And this, I'm not going to go into that right now, but, you know, this reflection theory of knowledge was sort of drawn complicatedly and, in my view, erroneously from Hegel via Engels, but that's a, a story I'm not going to tell right now. Okay. The important thing about this um, view of Bogdanov was that it became mm. we really weaponized. Um, so Lenin denounces Bogdanov as, uh, and the Russian Machiavellists as sort of, you know, um, persona non grata. And um, this way of kind of using philosophy as a, as a weapon uh, takes on, you know, forms a precedent really in the context of um, international Marxism. And Dieter Wittich has written about this, about the sort of reception history of materialism and imperial criticism, and he calls this the process of dogmatization of uh, that book, um, which was used to, you know, in other cases, notably that of Georg Lukács, who after he published History and Class Consciousness, which of course unleashed an enormous controversy for being too Hegelian, um, was advised by de Boren, who was one of his main critics in the debate that ensued from that, to read Lenin's critique of Bogdanov, you know, so um, the, the, the message is very clearly like, you need to go and um, read Lenin on Bogdanov, comrade, because uh, that's the lesson you need to learn. So this debate between um, sort of a mechanistic position and what I'm, you know, I mean, the, the, the debate is really between mechanists and dialecticians, so those who uh, espoused a, um, a mechanistic view of nature, which is to say that they um, argued so Bogdanov is, is, is a representative, Bukharin would be another, for instance, that, you know, natural science and the view of the world that it provides, and it was particularly a mechanistic view that they associated with that, was the kind of foundation of Marxism. Um, and this debate between uh, the, the, the mechanists on one side and the dialecticians on the other side, De Boren would be an example, Ryazanov another, um, was sort of organized around this this issue and the dialecticians um, were insisting on the importance of um, philosophy and particularly Hegelian philosophy in um, understanding you, you know in, in the elaboration of dialectics as what was sometimes called a universal science and together with that was a dialectical view of nature so the idea that we can understand the natural world as itself dialectically constructed as opposed to um, um, our knowledge of, of, of nature not being applicable in that sphere. Now, this is a complicated history, but it, it comes to a head in 1929 at the Congress of um, Marxist Scientists, in which mechanism is sort of condemned. Um, and then in the aftermath of that, uh, the party intervenes and uh, some kind of you know balance between these two forms of philosophy is supposedly found, <laughs> and then um, de Boren is later denounced to shortly after that by Stalin, um, and the dialectical sort of view is den denounced as a kind of idealism, because mechanism is perceived to be a, a more sort of um, amenable um, perspective for the kind of agrarian um, reform projects, reconstruction projects that Stalin wanted to pursue. Um, and the upshot of all of this is that by the 1930s, by the start of the 1930s, a mechanistic form of Marxism is the sort of doctrinaire um, form that is accepted uh, in the, the Soviet space. But of course, where does that, you know, leave us with the question of <laughs> consciousness, um, 
imagination, agency, change, and so on. Um, that is really the question. And that is the context in which blocks materialism seeks to intervene. So it aims to rethink the concept of matter from a dialectical materialist perspective. This is uh, Bloch's own claim in, in the preface, which a task which Bloch argues has hardly been attempted, as he puts it, despite Lenin, right? Um, and that already stages a kind of complex critique because he's saying, okay, uh, Lenin tried this, but he also failed, and you know we need to we need to start again. And his his criticism of this common term is pretty round in this preface. He says, you know, uh, that they had abandoned the theoretical development of materialism to solidification. Um, there was no longer any room for a human head in the vision of materialism that was espoused by uh, you know in the in the international, which is a robust critique, I would say. Um, and, and so this is the this is the intervention in the 1930s. Interestingly enough, in 1957, Bloch is going to be disciplined along the very lines that were set down by the dogmatization of materialism and imperial criticism. So after the publication of his Hegel book in 1951, which was, you know, did all the wrong things like, like history and class consciousness did, um, his students were bullied, he was pushed out of his job, and he was told at a tribunal that his philosophy was an attempt to smuggle in and you know a kind of idealism which is verbatim um the the words that lenin uses to 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 denounce bob Danov. so just to kind of give you a flavor of how that played out with Bloch. okay so that's the kind of background um i've been talking for ages already so i don't know how um how you would like me to go on joe <laughs> But, um, I mean, you can. I mean, you can carry on until you kind of feel like you reach a natural stopping point. I mean, maybe we all start doing questions in about what, maybe fifteen minutes. Is that good? That sounds good. So that I probably good, okay. won't. I probably won't get all the way through, mm. but um, you know, that's cool. So I'll definitely try and do ontology because that sort of says a lot of the. That sets up a lot of the stuff that we might want to talk about in, in questions. Okay, so. Um, so Bloch wants to preserve a materialist ontology while still accounting for the fact of consciousness, basically. That's what he's trying to, to do. Um, and in order to do this, he develops a, an, an, an anti-mechanistic concept of matter as the process of self-realizing, as a kind of process of self-realizing possibility. And to do this, he draws on Aristotelian categories of possibility and actuality, which roughly map onto the concepts of um, natura naturans and natura naturata um, that come, I mean, originally from Arabic philosophy through the sort of, um, you know, uh, scholastic thinkers and get picked up by people like Bruno, Spinoza, and then ultimately, of course, Shelley. So Bloch's concept of matter has these two components. One is what he calls duname on, but these are terms that he picks up from the metaphysics, um, I think book 10. And um, duname on is translated as what is impossibility. So Bloch in the principle of hope calls this the real substratum of possibility in the dialectical process. It refers to a kind of subjective factor in material uh, process reality, a kind of unconscious driving creative force, roughly natura naturans in the Spinoza's Trilogian thing. Um, and on the other hand, you've got catatodunaton, which is what is according to possibility, which refers to the kind of limits or conditions that matter creates for itself in the process of its self-realization. So it's the product, sort of the you know, nature-natured bit. Now, what I don't <coughs> want to say <laughs> is that Bloch, you know, isn't a Schillingian or something like that. Like clearly Schelling is all over this book and um I'm with Habermas in, in a certain way that we can call him a Marxist shelling. Um, so we see here from in, in this quote from Das Materialismus Problem, you know, Bloch affirmatively takes up this idea from Schelling's philosophy of nature of um, the, of, of natura naturans as a subject of nature, an unconscious intelligence, uh, a producer of nature, and so on, the subject and origin of um, of matter. I mean, there he's talking about Schelling's conception. I'll say a bit more about that in a minute. But um, 
he takes up this idea of, of, of a kind of subjective force in, in, in nature itself. So like Schelling's subject of nature, Bloch's matter is an unconscious intelligence, an impersonal agent. But where for Schelling, and Schelling does use the concept of matter as well, he tries to talk about what that is. He says it's the outcome of the play of natural forces of attraction and repulsion. So it's a product of nature. For Bloch, matter is the name of the process itself, right? Um, he also criticizes Schelling's idea. So a couple of ways in which he you know, goes beyond Schelling here. He, he criticizes Schelling's idea of an original ground of nature. So an original kind of, you know, historically originary time uh, in which the mind and subject and object, let's say, were one. And the the source of, of consciousness, the origin of consciousness, Schelling argues, is philosophy of nature, is the, what he calls the entsmeiung or direction of these two things. Bloch says, yeah, no, that's like, that's a problematic thing. It's bottomless pathology, as he says, um, because it reproduces the idea of the human being as somehow irredeemably fallen. You know, there was some perfect kind of beginning situation, and now we're alienated, and that's bad. Um, no, 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 Bloch says, it wasn't like that. Um, but there is something, he argues, that's fundamentally not yet as it should be, he thinks we need to have some description of, of why there is this sort of process. And so he kind of pop, di, you know, picks up and deposits the possibility of unity at the end of the thing. So there was no original unity. <clears throat> you know, the source of consciousness is just the result of this desire in matter itself for identity with itself, basically, is the claim that he makes. Um, you know, this you know, could sound to you like, okay, that sounds reasonable. It could sound totally weird. I'm not sure. We'll see when we get to the questions. So, um, yeah. But another problem that, Sh that Bloch sees with um, Schelling's conception of nature or the subject of nature is that he doesn't think there's any logic at work in it. Um, and clearly there is logic at work in the natural world, right? The natural world that science tells us about and the natural world that we encounter in our everyday lives. Um, and so for this idea of logic at work in nature, where does he go? Well, he goes to Hegel, who had taken obviously a quite different way out of the Kantian paradox of, you know, how can we, if we can't, if we can't have knowledge of, the in itself, the, well, the problem that Kant left us with there, and he tries to answer it himself, obviously, in critique of judgment, but is, um, you know, if there's this real kind of gap between phenomena and noumena, how can we explain how science works, basically? How is it that it's possible for us to, like, do stuff with stuff? So the problem of intelligibility, and with a kind of intelligibility with an eye on practical um, uh, practical issues. So Schelling, he gets around this by saying, you know, well, there was an ori original kind of unity between the two, so there's some sort of relic of the way in which we're connected, and that's how we explain it. Um, Hegel wants to say, well, no, you know, if we are going to believe what natural science tells us about things like natural laws and natural kinds, yeah, so that an apple will always fall from the tree under gravity, or that a human being is always going to give birth to a human child, you know, there's got to be some kind of continuity inherent in the things themselves. It's not just our knowledge of them. It's not just some kind of transcendental projection. So Hegel argues that, that the structure of the concept um, has, uh, you know, does actually connect us to something uh, real that is continuous in all the discrete manifestations of a, of a thing. So, um, Bloch takes this idea of logic as inherent in the material world from Hegel and kind of inserts it into his theory of matter. The logic as the real attribute of the material can no longer be defrauded, he claims. Um, and he also steals other concepts from Aristotle, Entelechy, mm. and um, energy to sort of theorize this logic that's at work in um, matter. So matter for Bloch becomes the name for a process in and through which potentiality is actualized, yeah. Um, so the fact that the fact that, you know, the the 
we have emerged um, is evidence for Bloch of this kind of real possibility at the heart of, um, of, of the fabric of reality itself, basically. He's trying to answer the question, uh, the philosopher, contemporary Belgian philosopher, Isabel Stengers, um, says, you know, materialism has to answer the question or has to be able to give an account of nature that in which it's not absurd for it to have produced us, yeah? And that's really what Bloch is trying to do in this book. Okay. Um, so I'm going to like skip on to epistemology just quickly because I want to get to that bit as well. Um, so the point that I kind of want to make, there's much more to say about this, of course, but the point that I want to make about the ontology part is that Hegel is just as important for Bloch here as, um, as Schelling, certainly, in terms of the, you know, the theory of matter that he develops and the theory of nature that he develops. Um, so, okay, one down. Yes, Habermas, he is a Schellingian, but he's also a Hegelian too. Um, now, the claim about epistemology, the main claim, of course, was that Bloch, you know, just rejects Kant, goes back to something um, pre-critical. And of course, um, this concept that I've just introduced, the, uh, the, 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 Hegelian structure of the concept, which he takes up, um, does potentially gesture in that direction, right? Like there is something about the structure of the concept which has access to something um, in the thing that enables us to do stuff with our knowledge, is the claim. Um, but, sorry, this is not a very helpful quote actually for uh, illustrating that point, but anyway. Um, but, you know, this doesn't mean that he abandons Kant, far from it. In the uh, um, Spirit of Utopia, Bloch's first book, in the 1918 version, the first version, already there, you know, he says, we have to let Kant shine through Hegel. We can't have this sort of pan-logicist vision of things that he argues Hegel develops, because that actually robs us of the moment of individual cognition, right? Um, and of, 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 of empirical subjectivity, obviously, you know, Kant is, um, transcendentalism is, is, is not necessarily about empirical subjectivity, but it also is that. And so um, Kant's in there right from the beginning, but in the materialism book, he's there too. And we can see a number of ways in which, or a number of ev bits of evidence for, um, for this. So the first one would be, uh, okay, so I'll just maybe step back one moment. So in the materialism book, Bloch does follow the Hegelian line on structure of the concept, is what I wanted to say. Um, his concept of matter is designed to be a speculative concept in precisely this sense. So it's the index of some kind of unifying force or agency that he thinks we have to assume ontologically underpins material reality and consciousness as part of that reality in order to explain the phenomenon of intelligibility in the first place. That's his claim here. But he doesn't abandon Kant. And one way in which we can see this is, for example, in his approving quotation of um, the neo-Kantian philosopher and psychologist Karl Stumpf, who um, was, this is a quote from Stumpf that Bloch quotes in Mm, just materialism is probably where Stumpf is kind of mocking the absurd implication of mechanical materialism, right? So he's mocking the mechanical materialists in a speech to the Munich Congress of Psychologists in 1896. He's saying, you know, um, here we are at this Congress talking about stuff, writing poetry, <laughs> uh, and so on, as if thinking, feeling, willing didn't exist at all, um, right? So Bloch's point here is to, um, uh, so Stumpf's point was to poke fun at the scientific materialists' belief that they could make claims about the nature of reality as a whole without accounting critically for the epistemic position of the observer. 
and that Bloch invokes this argument to counter the naive metaphysics of mechanical materialism. And at this point in the book, he's talking about 19th century mechanical materialism. But as we've seen in the historical context in which he's writing of the Third International, um, you know, that is one in which mechanical materialism of a very particular kind is hegemonic. And so his criticism of the historical form is also criticism of the contemporary form. Um, so that Bloch invokes this argument, you know, demonstrates that he was far from unaware of the constitutive role that subjectivity plays in conditioning a knowledge of reality. Another thing that I do definitely want to mention, because it's kind of fun, um, when he talks about Stumpf here, he says the German phrase is like, he ironisiert, yeah? Um, I think I translated that as he waxes ironic. Um, and the role of irony is really important as well. And this goes to the point about Bloch's style and its epistemological function, okay? So Bloch's reference to irony in the, in the stuff about Stumpf um, marks him out as the heir of, or the heir to, early romantic uh, responses to Kant, found in the work of people like Friedrich Schlegel, Novalis, uh, Hölderlin, and so on. So these thinkers, you know, um, also in the same situation as Hegel and Schelling with this question of, well, how can we access the in itself? They recognize that, you know, human thought and language are really only part of the totality that we seek to articulate. And therefore philosophy, philosophy, which is expressed, of course, linguistically, can't represent that totality. So, Schlegel in the Lyceum Fragments makes a number of claims around this. He says that, you know, um, pure thinking and condition of the highest can't be represented adequately. And therefore, you know, philosophy has to embrace the techniques of poetry with, um, in order to sort of adumbrate the whole fragmentarily, right? Um, through dialogue, through, you know, metaphor, through perspectival techniques, whatever you want. Um, and, and Bloch, you know, absolutely takes this up, okay? Um, in the book, I do a nice little, I don't have time for it now, and it's a bit kind of, um, I'm not sure what I think about it now, actually, but, um, you know, I do a nice little literary kind of formal analysis of, of, of Bloch's writing style, where he sort of, uh, posing and answering some of the same questions that Novalis poses in his book, Heinemisch von Ofterdingen, where he has these sort of repeated phrase of question and answer, where are we going? And the idea is always homeward, yeah? Um, and this expresses this idea that, you know, we, we want to sort of get somewhere, but we'll never get there. It's an, it's a, an, an endless approximation, unendliche um, Annäherung, that unity with with the object is an unendliche Annäherung. Um, and Bloch, you know, kind of performs this compositionally very beautifully in The Principle of Hope, where he opens the book with um, these questions, who are we, where do we come from, where are we going, what is waiting for us when we get there. And then the final word of the book is Heimat, which means home, homeland something. And, you know, read in a kind of linear way, you can see this is a question and answer thing, but Heimat in the German speaking space is also associated with the quest for origins, you know, um, beginnings. And so there's a circularity to the sort of technique that Bloch uses there um, as well. There are lots of other ways in which Bloch is doing, you know, doing literature, doing stylistically interesting things with his writing. And the main point here is really that these features are not obsolete or some kind of appendage, but they're actually signaling his insight into the impossibility in the present, at least, of fully articulating the absolute in the kind of way that Habermas and um, that tradition of interpretation uh, suggests when we suggest that Bloch is a pre kantian thinker. Okay, I'm just going to stop. Like, I haven't said anything about politics, really, um, and I haven't finished talking about epistemology either but i think it's just better to stop talking and um have some questions and discussion cool wonderful thank you so much that was really um like really wide-ranging 
presentation, which took in, you know, we, we kind of sort of moved from kind of Aristotle through to the 19th century into the politics of the 20th century. And it was really, yeah, really, really um, kind of enlightening to see, you know, the way in which Bloch is engaged in all kinds of debates that we don't necessarily think of him as being engaged with, or certainly if you read the, um, you know, just the Harvard Mass Critique, you wouldn't necessarily think he was engaged. So that was really, really enlightening. Um, I think we've already had a request for a question uh, from Tommaso. So, if, Tommaso, do you want to um, do you want to put your question to Pat? Um, can I be heard? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Thank you, Haikat. Thank you very much for this very very nice presentation. Um, especially, I like the whole kind of history of mechanical versus vitalist materialism, which I thought was uh, very interesting. What I wanted to ask you... <laughs> what I wanted to ask you is um, to expand... I'm to expand a little bit on it in terms of moving from philosophy um, to history or to politics. And you've kind of done this a little bit in the end, but I wonder if you could do this a bit more. Let me be a bit clearer about what I mean by giving you some examples. Um, you mentioned Bogdanov, for example. Um, and uh, one of Bogdanov's associates is Lunacharsky, which is someone who, although I think he gives up on his empirical criticism, he, um, he, he goes on to develop a lot of you know cultural politics with, with this association, Prolet Kult. And then I even think he becomes minister for education in the Soviet Why Union. Why is a man named Charlie? Um, and, and so on and so forth. Uh, um, and, and, and this is someone who would be on the kind of idealist, vitalist side of the divide. And then he goes on to have a certain kind of cultural politics. Um, on the other hand, if you, if you take if you take um, from the context of second international Marxism, there is always this, you know, this this kind of big bad thing, which is the SPD Marxism, which is mechanistic, positivistic, so on and so forth. Why are you trying to call me up? But, um, but, um, sorry. John, can you mute your thing, please? Sorry, can I continue? Yeah, sorry, I'm just losing my thread with this. Yeah, um, if everyone could mute their mics, um, uh, and then Tommaso can finish his question. So, yeah. Hey, can you mute as a host? Can you mute people or not? Uh, I can do, but the problem is they uh, they unmute when they speak, and then they mute again, so it's tricky. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. I guess the question is to uh, <clears throat> to what extent what is really going on in these debates is a discussion about cosmology, about the nature of matter, and to what extent these are masked political strategies. So idealist, uh, vitalist people will, generally speaking, tend to have um, kind of emphasis on cultural politics, on popular education, so on and so forth. Um, uh, although I don't think there is a kind of clear mapping between um, certain types of politics and certain types of philosophy. So for example, take SPD Marxism, which is generally considered very positive, very mechanistic. But at the same time, that kind of Marxism is the, the, the Marxism of a mass party. So it is to a very, very large extent, very practical political language. Uh, and, 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 and there is an argument which can be made that that kind of very crass positivism is what works better in certain contexts to mobilize people, to organize people, and so on and so forth. So I was wondering if you have any thoughts on, on, on whether there are standard politics which are associated with these philosophical positions or, or not. Thank you. Um, thanks for that question. Um, do I think there are standard philosophical, uh, standard political positions that are associated with these philosophical um, arguments? I mean, I suppose the kind of quick answer to that is just to say no, like, um, you know, somebody like, 
Ernst Haeckel. Somebody like Ernst Haeckel, you know, who um, was a pretty full-bodied vitalist in the, you know, in the, both scientifically and philosophically, who advanced this kind of pre-adaptive Darwinian theory of evolution that was, uh, I don't know, like haunted by the spirit of some kind of Goethean thing. Um, 